Hi, I'm John Curry, Professor of Pastoral Theology here at Westminster Theological Seminary, and it's my pleasure and my privilege to spend the next couple of minutes uh, giving you a brief introduction to the topic of infant baptism. Before Jesus ascended, at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, it records that He gave this command and commission to His disciples, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age." Well, there could be no greater priority and privilege for Christians than the, the discipleship of their own children. And it's very significant that in the first baptism that we see recorded in Scripture after that command and commission was given to Jesus' disciples, the Pentecost sermon of the Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 2 when some 3,000 come to faith in Jesus. At the end of that sermon, the Apostle Peter says this in Acts chapter 2 verse 39, he says, For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to Himself. Now, why would the Apostle Peter choose to include children in that statement? Because Peter and the audience he's speaking to are soaked in the promises of the Old Testament, central to which is the promise of the covenant that God gave to Abraham. We find it in Genesis chapter 17. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your offspring after you. And then in chapter 17, verse 11, he says this, You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. So God established His covenant with Abraham and promised that that covenant would be with Abraham's offspring forever, and that the sign of that covenant would be the sign of circumcision. When we come to the New Testament, the Apostle Paul tells us three very important things in relationship to this covenant promise. First of all, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, he tells us that in Christ all the promises of God are yes. Second, he tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14, that the children of believers are set apart in covenant relationship to God. He calls them holy. And then thirdly, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, he tells us that the, new the sign of the new covenant, which has replaced that old covenant sign of circumcision, is actually the sign Jesus gave to His disciples, the sign of baptism. And so it's believe God's, believing God's covenant promise that He gave to Abraham is that's interpreted by Peter and by Paul that we follow Jesus' command in making disciples by applying the sign of baptism to the children of believers. We, when we do that, we are admitting the children of believers into Christ's covenant community, into the visible church and into the covenant of grace. And we're giving them a picture of the gospel. The baptism shows them and us that we and our children are born in sin and that we need to be cleansed and that that cleansing and that forgiveness comes only through faith in Jesus Christ. And because the time of the application of baptism doesn't necessarily coincide with the inward work of the Holy Spirit, which it signifies. When we baptize our children, we're not making an infallible declaration about their internal or eternal state. But through their baptism, we call them and we remind them to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who alone can forgive their sins, and to turn from their sin, and to walk in obedience to God's commands in His covenant. See, in baptism, the triune God of Scripture puts His name on us and on our children, and He calls us to believe in Jesus Christ and to walk in His ways in new obedience to God.